This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. It is the 5th day of July 2011, and today I'm joined on the line by Madi Darius Nazamroya, the Global Research Associate, who is now on a trip to Tripoli. He is in Tripoli right now, reporting from Libya about what's happening in that country as we speak. So, Madi, it's great to have you back on the program. Please tell us what's going on. Okay. They've been bombing sites that have nothing whatsoever to do with military, facilities, combat, or command and control. They've been bombing granaries, food storage places, hospitals. Uh, people from around the world have seen it. I've spoken to foreign nationals who've been living here for business reasons or for family reasons, or they just like Libya generally. A fellow Canadian was telling me he was held. They bombed everywhere, residential areas. They've been bombing for no reason. I spoke to an Italian lady the other day. She was telling me she used to believe everything the media said until she started living what the media was saying and contradicted reality. Uh, she was disgusted. I've spoken to people from, uh, from all over uh, the world who've been living here. They've, they're in shock because they, they can't they, they cannot bring uh, the media fabrications to terms with reality here. And I can tell you right now, I was in Tripoli on Friday with a vast uh, uh, group of foreign journalists from all over the world, Britain, France, the United States, Russia, Japan, uh, I, I mean China, and the Washington Post, BBC, all of them lied about the, uh, the event. Over a million people, roughly, the government says about two million people, were there. And they said nothing about it. And all these people were there freely. No one forced anybody to come. The next day, the BBC reported, because a lot of these people came out of town to show their support for the government and for Libya and to show they're against this war of aggression by NATO. So a lot of them slept there uh, during the night, and they left in the morning. And BBC reported that they're fleeing Tripoli. They slept, and they were leaving. These are the type of lies you hear. I've been here with the foreign reporters, and, and they are concocting stories. I, I'm a witness to this. You have journalists who haven't left this, the premises here at the Rexis El Nasser Hotel, formerly Turkish, soon to be Swiss. The government's nationalized it uh, for right now. Um, but uh, I'm at the Rexis uh, El Nasser Hotel, which is where the official spokesman of the government is. Uh, and the media coordination for Tripoli is based here. And the, there are reporters here that are concocting wild stories and accusations. Uh, the other day... Um, the other day, I, I saw a report from CNN by uh, uh, Sarah uh, Snyder, I believe her name is. I'm just going to double check her name. If you don't. Yeah, Sarah Sidner, based in from New Delhi. She was talking about rape in Miserata. That didn't happen. The tape she showed, she should do some research on the video she's showing and CNN showing. That was in a domestic event that happened months before this conflict in Tripoli. The accent of the person wasn't even an accent from that area of Libya it was from Tripoli and they knew each other it was a rape it was abuse but it was not soldiers raping a woman okay it was totally spun these accusations of rape are false they're using depleted uranium here uh, the a group of scientists uh, working at the Nuclear Energy Institute of uh, Libya have confirmed this they're going to come out with a report in English Arabic and various other languages showing that depleted uranium has been used I've also uh, contacted some scientists abroad who might be involved in this project. The war crimes and crimes against humanity are going on against this country. And there's daily flights to God knows where in the south, in Fezzan, from here. I, I've seen the jets. They've been bombing residential areas. The war crimes are going on here, and the media has been uh, um, a party to this war. Well, tell us about that rally, because we did see some of the Im images only broadcast on the Internet, of course. We didn't see them on CNN or anywhere else, but that just looked like an incredible mass of people. Were you actually in the rally? What was the mood of people yes. there? Yes, I was at the rally. I actually was interviewed by uh, Telesur. Uh, uh, I took pictures even of some of the Italian journalists uh, there, and uh, I was on the rooftop, and let me tell you something. No one forced those people to come. And when I left, and I, I will show these photos. They'll be published. Um, when I left, there were still people coming from the mountains, which they say are against uh, the government. Not true, because I met people coming from there. Uh, the majority
majority of them are not. There were still tribes that were coming. And I, I personally believe there was over a million, easily over a million people there. And they had flags, uh, green flags, and no one forced these people to come. And you know what? They, were, they all have weapons. There is a civil defense policy that has been initiated here. Every house in Tripoli is armed. They're waiting if they, uh, in case there's an invasion. This pla if these people were against Gaddafi, they wouldn't have arms. They would be fight. They would be fighting him. So the media has totally lied. It has totally violated its responsibility uh, to inform uh, the public about the truth. Li Tripoli is a beautiful city, and what astonishes me about what's going on here is that people here are trying to live regular, normal lives. They're, they're trying to live, function as they would without the war. And I, I admire them for that. I watch them with the deal. They're trying to live normal lives. Now, this war has affected businesses, foreigners, schools, children's uh, uh, vital supplies. It's, it's a criminal act. One of the first places they bombed was uh, one of the facilities that makes Libyan dinars. What does that have to do with saving civilians? And now we hear that there are, the French have openly admitted they're arming uh, uh, forces against the government in this insurgency. Well, they might have admitted it now, but we knew they were doing this earlier. Now Qatar is talking about it. Some people are shocked, but Qatar said this in March, in April. Uh, people should wake up. They've been saying we're arming them from the beginning. The uh, Wall Street Journal, Reuters, they all reported that the Egypt that weapons were coming in, the U.S. was supplying weapons into Egypt. Uh, the Amir of Qatar was talking to Wolf Blitzer, I believe, on CNN. He was on CNN. He admitted it openly. Al Jazeera brought it up a few days later with Secretary General of NATO. This is a breach of international law. The arms, uh, the ATT, uh, which is the Convention for Selling Weapons, it's a breach of that, and it's a breach of the U.S. Security Council resolutions. They have to be held accountable for this, and there should be Nuremberg-style trials in the future about the atrocities that are happening in Libya at the hands of NATO and their proxies on the ground here. So what are the sense of the, the people there that, uh, that an invasion is likely? Do, are people uh, prepared for that, that uh, concept? Uh, we've got Debka file now reporting that there's an invasion slotted for two weeks hence, and we've also had uh, sources from Fort Hood saying that uh, there's likely to be troops on the ground by October. Uh, what, what are the people on the ground there uh, saying and thinking about the possibility of a NATO invasion? Well, I have news uh, that reached Tripoli from Capitol Hill that congressmen are talking about ending this on the ground. And as you probably know, and a lot of your viewers and listeners know, Senator McCain and uh, a core of uh, uh, American politicians were for boots on the ground from the beginning. Uh, NATO has not ruled that out either. Uh, the uh, Supreme Commander of NATO, uh, who's a U.S. Admiral, has also confirmed that that's a possibility. He calls it a stabilization mission. These were all said at the beginning. These are not new things that are going to happen. Now, the people's mood the people will fight. I guarantee you, seeing them, talking to them, they are ready, they will fight. Every single house in Tripoli and the district around it will be turned into a bear. NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, would have to be fools to invade this country. That's why they haven't done it now. They would have to be fools, and I think we're going to see the graveyard of NATO if they enter this country. It's going to be the beginning of the end for this, uh, of this terrible military uh, alliance it's purely aggressive, not defensive whatsoever. Yugoslavia, Afghanistan, it's been, it's been uh, it's a day. good riddance to garbage. But every single person in, in this country, women, child, man, they're ready. They are, they're armed and they're ready. They have sit neighborhood uh, defense uh, organizations. They've been armed. That was not a threat. They've been armed. And they're waiting in case there is an invasion. Now, I'm not going to speculate whether the invasion is going to happen or not. But I will tell you, if it does happen, it's going to be a huge mistake. Well, last time we talked, you were talking about how Syria might be next on the chopping block, and it seemed like this was uh, something that was going to carry on with some momentum. But it sounds like you've changed, uh, changed your mind, and you, you think that this will actually be the, the final resistance. No, I, I haven't changed my mind. I think Syria still 
in the crosshairs. I just think the means by which they'll do this to Syria and Lebanon is going to be different. It won't be a direct invasion. They have a whole toolbox of uh, aggressive methods that they use against countries. It could be low-spectrum warfare, narcotics, uh, you know, color revolutions. Syria is, uh, is a full, it's a full uh, ally of Iran. It's a staunch strategic ally of Iran. If they go to war with Syria, you're going to see Iranian intervention because of the, not a, the military... Uh, mutual defense pact both these countries have. Tehran will come to Damascus and say, I guarantee that. Uh, I've spoken to people here who uh, come from that part of the world and they, they, they're saying the same things on the same lines that I'm saying. We'll also see other players get involved in this war. Russia has bases there. The Chinese have interests. This is why they didn't agree with any movements against Syria. Uh, you won't see an invasion of Syria yet. That In the future, that might happen. But if that happens, it's going to be a broader war that will involve Tehran and other countries. It will go right from the eastern Mediterranean, involve Lebanon and Jordan, all the way to the Chinese border. That's what's going to happen. A major war would break out if they invade Syria. Uh, this is why we see the Turks. The Turks are a major player in this. Uh, they, the, the military bases that NATO has there are being transformed. Now you're seeing NATO troops being transported. Uh, transferred from Spain and Germany to Turkey. Turkey will play a much more active role in, in the, uh, NATO's uh, military roadmap in the Middle East, and those bases can be used against Iran and Armenia as well. Armenia is an Iranian and Russian ally, and it's a part of the Collective Security Treaty Organization. And this will obviously have uh, ramifications for the relations between Georgia and Russia, and Russia will be targeted eventually as well with its former Soviet allies. So the picture does not look good in the long term. Right now, a color revolution is what they're going for in Syria, uh, and they're, they're supplying weapons and funding to opposition groups. But I don't think we'll see a military in intervention yet. And uh, despite what Senator Lieberman and his colleagues say about invading Syria and Iran, just like Libya, they will see. What, they, what happens in Libya is a measuring stick for what's going to happen in Syria and Iran. So... If, if they're successful here, we can see them turning their heads there. But they're not near any type of success here in regards to the western part of the country. They have managed, albeit, to divide the country. But I'll tell you, in the east, most of the fighters are not Libyans. Most of the fighters have been brought in. Even before I came, my trip was delayed because the highway from uh, Jerba in Tunisia, uh, which is the main city on the frontier, uh, it was, um, it was, uh, the, was uh, the highway was closed off for a while. Because about 160 foreign fighters were brought in by sea. They were brought in by sea. There's no way they came by land. It was NATO that brought them there. They were there and they, all they were there was for destabilization and they cut off the, the road for a while. And on the way, there was at least 50 checkpoints on the way to Tripoli. And the people who, who manned these were volunteers, old people, uh, young people, people of various uh, walks of life. This is a resistance of the Libyan people against NATO. And I'm sorry to say, some of the Libyan people have been hoodwinked by NATO and the media, and they're turning against their brothers and sisters. And uh, this has been a poison in Libya, and the Arabic term for it is fitna, division, which we can call in strategic terms, balkanization. Yes, they've divided this country, but the East, this is not an East-West thing, but the forces in the East are a minority. And I, I can tell you that with full confidence. Well, we've uh, we've heard in the alternative media, obviously not in the the mainstream press in North America, but in the alternative media, there's been reports of the atro atrocities that are being committed by the so-called rebel troops and forces, uh, uh, primarily against the black population in in Libya. What have you seen on the ground of of evidence of that kind of uh, atrocity going on? Well, I, I not just on the ground. I've seen video footage before I entered the country about that, Do documented uh, that that's been happening. That has been happening. Yes, uh, Libyans of black skin have been scapegoated. Uh, they've been attacked, yes. It has to do with some historical differences as well. And, and it has to do with the groupthink process and the media manipulation. Uh, and uh, they were used as an excuse. We had media lies about mercenaries, which they unfortunately demonized in a racist way, uh, black Libyans. Uh, we had the uh, aerial attacks, the false jet attacks on civilians. Uh, we had these stories concocted, which, which caused this. As far as rape, 
the rape that I know about is the rape being uh, the rape being uh, committed by rebel forces. I don't know to what degree, but they are committing rape. I've heard of no rape from uh, from the Libyan military, which the West and the media and the Pentagon and Hillary Clinton called pro-Gaddafi forces. This is this is political language. 